three, two, one, action. All right, hello everyone. It is 2020 and Luca and I are on board the International Space Station. We have uh, two video cameras here pointing uh, two different directions. We're almost getting a full 360 view here. And right now we are all the way in the aft part of the space station. We're on the Soyuz uh, MS-15 that is docked to SM aft. This is the Soyuz that I'm gonna go home on, uh, but it is actually the one that Oleg Skripochka, Jessica Mir, and Haza Al-Mansouri arrived on, and, uh, and I'll go home with them. So right, right now I'm in the descent module of the Soyuz here, and this is the hatch between them. So we're all the way as far back as we could possibly get inside the, uh, inside the ISS. And so here behind me are our seats and the parachutes behind me, I don't think we'll be able to get the whole camera in there. And then on the other end there is Luca, and he's in the um, the living mo module, the BEO, the habitation module of the Soyuz. Go yeah, ahead, let's Luke. Keep that, let's keep some coordinates, Drew. Right now, because we are in the aft side, the, the Earth is that direction, if I'm, if I'm correct. That sound, I agree with that, yeah. The Earth is that way. The, 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 the universe, the rest of the universe is this way. And behind me is the rest of the space station, what we call the central stack. All right, there are a couple things that you want to point out there in the in the descent or in the uh, in the bell. Absolutely. So over here, this is uh, where some of the systems are. Uh, we have the, the toilet, just in case we have to stay here more than a couple of hours during the ascent. We have ventilators and fans and. Uh, our uh, cleaning system so that we can scrub the atmosphere of the CO2. Over here we have a, a, a vacuum, vacuum manometer, which is the way we measure the pressure in your space. Uh, and this is what I'm holding on to. This is the docking module, uh, which also turns into the hatch. So when we are coming in, we use this to dock onto the space station and then it opens towards the inside and uh, this is, this is the part that actually impacted the space station when we docked. Over here to my, uh, to my right, uh, these are the actual systems that are computers in here for navigation and, uh, um, uh, and computation. And then, nicely aligned, there are three spacesuits over here. Uh, one of them is uh, yours, uh, Drew. The other, two's are, the other two are Jessica's and Alex. And uh, there are a couple of things that we added since we arrived. We have three gas masks. These are in case we have an ammonia leak on the space station for emergency. We have to fly to, the, to our spacecraft in order to come back to Earth as soon as possible. And so we have ammonia mask to get to get in order to survive. And uh, emergency procedures, the daily descending instructions. These these numbers let us know how to quickly come back to Earth uh, in case of emergency. Uh, in this. In this container, there is food. This is, again, just in case we have to spend a couple of days up here inside the, the Soyuz on the way to the space station. We, uh, none of our crew had to use it, but there, there was food in here. And apparently there is also a little, a little happy birthday balloon from, uh, from when we celebrated uh, the birthdays. So uh, we can start traveling back, and the next, the next stop is going to be the entrance into uh, the SM, the service module, which is the heart and soul of the Russian segment. Interesting thing, with my crew, so Drew and I and Alexander Sportsov, we both arrived in this location and then we maneuvered to a different location. So as we move towards the SM, you're going to fly the same way that we did as we ingressed to the space station back in July, July 20th of 2019. Luca, you might you hit the lights and I'll just fly through in the dark. Yeah, I'm gonna turn off the lights so that we save some energy. Okay, I'm flying toward you.
Alright, Drew, why don't you give me a description of where we are? Okay, well, we're in the, um, in the service module of the Russian segment, and this is a design that the Russians have used in their space program now for decades. It's uh, very similar to the Soyuz spacecraft, and, uh, and, or the Soyuz space station, as well as, uh, as Mir. And uh, there's the docking port back there. Here's the toilet over here, the ASU. Um, it's all decorated for Christmas. Alexander uh, Sasha Skortsov decorated the uh, Keteo, which uh, collects solid waste. It says Snovum Goldum, which means congratulations with the new year. Um, and then there are two crew quarters back here on either side, and our, our two cr ru uh, Russian cosmonaut crewmates, uh, Sasha and Oleg, live in, in uh, these two Cayudas, they call them. And they spend most of their day back here working uh, in, in the Russian segment. There's a table here that we share. They have their, all their meals, and when we have meals together, we have at, at this, uh, this table. And they put tape on it to hold things down. Their water dispenser. And then... Uh, Some Christmas decorations. Yeah, yeah so Christmas decorations up because uh, we're just making it through the holiday. Um, this looks very familiar to us because the simulator in Star City is an, an identical exact replica of this. And so when I showed up in here, it felt like exactly like being in the simulator back there in Star City. It was, it's, a, it's perfect. It's a genial scenery. It is, completely. Um, they have a lot of their camera equipment mounted on the walls here on either side. And they have windows, earth facing down here. Right now we're in a night pass, can't see them, uh, see any light coming through them, but they're really nice optical quality uh, lights for taking pictures straight down of the earth. This area in here is called the, the central post, the central command post. It has uh, control, did you, uh, I want to show the caution and warning panel and the... Uh, uh, Go ahead and take the camera. Yep. Uh, the caution and warning panel there and all of the... Old uh, computers that they used to work. Yeah. Now they, we don't use these almost. We can almost never use these anymore. Okay, we'll continue into the adapter. Into the PKO. And uh, if you want to swap to me, and I'll take the yeah. take the camera, and you can. Um, Talk about which way you're going to go first. You're going to go up? So we're going to go up. And there's Hello, Alexander. <laughs> Hello. It's a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> because I have finished only uh, my physical exercise. And it's one that I finished with the rest. <laughs> okay. So, so do you, uh, can you say hi? Hi. Say hello. Uh, hello. No, I can say hi, hello <laughs> for everybody who will see this movie. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so we're in the um, PGO and we're looking. Um, so this is the PGO is just a, uh, a, a junction. It's it's the equivalent of a node uh, for the for the US US segment. Basically. It's it's a spherical module, uh, part of the module where you can you can attach to four different sides, and um, you have modules that are being used for different things. Uh, one one of the things that we use this module for is for EVAs, and that's the one uh, behind Drew, and we will go there later. But it, but before I want to show you this one, we're gonna go down to see my Soyuz. Uh, the one that Drew and I came up with, and uh, just very quickly. Did uh, and you uh, you said already that this is meme too? I I don't know. Remember. I haven't said oh, that. Okay. So this is called the mini, uh, the the mini research module number two in Russian, uh, M R M, uh, M M E M two meme dva, and in in the U.S. we usually say M R M two. As you can say, there is a lot of storage everywhere. This is true all over the space station. We always have storage uh, in every available surface. There are two older uh, spacesuits here that I don't know if you can see in the view. 
the Orlan spacesuits I use for the for the Russian EVAs. These two are the older models. They are not used anymore. They're just here for storage. Uh, this is where they are kept. And then we go we go more inside. And so welcome to. Uh, um, this Sorry, is MS Soyuz MS-13. Um, there were there were some concerns on some people that the number 13 is bad luck, but luckily for me it's always been a lucky number. In Italy, 13 is used to be a big win in a lot of like game, and also my fighter squadron was the 13th squadron, so uh, all good things for me. And over here, basically the design is identical to the Soyuz that we just saw. Uh, the arrangement is slightly different because instead of having the spacesuits here, they're put here on the side. Uh, the three spacesuits that uh, in only in about a month I will be uh, going back down it. And then again, tiny space for the descent module down here. And we can go back up. And we'll fly into the MIM, the SO1, SO1. If if you want to zoom now, you can guide them into their progress. Okay. Okay. This is uh, SO1. Um, and I don't even know what we what do we call it in English. I don't know. Uh, uh, but S O N D and really only the Russian nomenclature matters. Um, but this is used as an airlock. And here are their two Orlan spacesuits that they would make a spacewalk with. Um, our Russian colleagues also keep a lot of their uh, clothing, clothes, and uh, personal hygiene items in here as well. And uh, we have a Progress resupply vehicle docked that docked earlier a couple weeks ago and uh, still has a lot of offloading uh, to do. But you can see all the containers stacked inside there and they slowly unpack those over the coming weeks and months because it stays docked. This one particular, particular will stay docked for several months. All right, so we go through the, out of SOD and back into the Pekka O, we'll do another 180 with the camera and then uh, into the FGB. I think they call it DC-1 in DC-1 uh, in English, yeah. Yeah, yeah. docking compartment. Right. Actually, why don't you go that way and I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Can I go ahead? Okay. Now, this to me is a little bit like going into a, into a living museum because this is the oldest piece the oldest module of the space station. It's currently probably the oldest human object uh, orbiting the Earth because uh, it was launched in uh, 1999, celebrating 20 years this year. Uh, or actually having celebrated already 20 years. And uh, if it flew by itself. It was launched uh, as a single spacecraft and it, it flew by itself for uh, several months before being docked to Node 1. And again, this is just like the other modules that we saw, is an exact replica of the Mir space station modules. Um, this one specifically is called the F FGB, FGB in, uh, in English, and it's, a, it's basically a support module. Behind this panel, just like on the deck, there's a lot of storage, some systems, not many, uh, but definitely, a, this is the main compartment for storage for our Russian colleagues. However, because it was it was built in Russia but paid for uh, with a cooperation with NASA, I think that a lot of this, uh, about half of it of its compartment are uh, have now NASA storage in it. Uh, the way I see it in my mind, every time I think about this, I see a stair, a ladder because this is how I move into it. Just. Uh, going down this ladder this way. So somehow, even when I'm on Earth and I think about this, in my mind, it's always been a ladder going up.
Drew, what are you showing them there? I was just showing, these are mission patches from the Soyuz. So we have uh, expedition patches for the ISS expeditions, but also have um, patches for each Soyuz crew. And these are some of the historic ones that have docked here in the past. Many people we know. So, um, this is obviously a very, very busy compartment in terms of stowage, but uh, uh, crazy enough to, uh, even though it sounds crazy, there is an order to this. And uh, usually when we, when we have to go grab something, we know behind which panel or at which height we have to go grab, grab things. Um, now the only, the only part of the space station and that, of this module, excuse me, that doesn't have anything on the deck is right here because um, this is where our Russian colleagues uh, take their, their hygiene breaks. So uh, th th there's a big mirror Probably the, probably the biggest mirror on the space station is right here. Yeah. I never thought about that. Uh, and these containers that you see on the side, these are uh, where our Russian colleagues have their um, uh, their personal hygiene items. And so uh, what happens is that they come here, they close this hatch, partially close this hatch to get some privacy, and then they can shower, clean up in the morning. And uh, and we know when the hatch is closed that that's, that's what's happening. From here, uh, we are going to go into one more docking module which is called the MIM ADIN or MRM1 mini research module number one and uh, it's a little bigger in terms of length but very tiny and for me it's a, it's a sweet memory because it's where I docked my first time in 2013 with, with Expedition 36 on Soyuz TMA0 TMA M9 you down into there oh then... yeah there is not a there's not a lot of space in space and I'll I'll stay up here in the gap yeah I'm just gonna show uh, right now as you can see this module is being used mostly for stowage uh, there is there is some science going on on the side that's why it's called the mini research module but because there is nothing docked Currently on the docking compartment, which is at the very end of this uh, of this module, uh, they use it for storage. Because again, we you have to think that every time something um, comes up, it has to go somewhere, and we have to have storage in, to last in case something doesn't dock. So we have to have redundancy. That's why there is so much stuff on the space station. So it, if if this uh, docking compartment had a Soyuz or a Progress right now you would see that part completely emptied out and the spacecraft docked at the very end. Uh, this is the very first module that I flew in, so uh, sweet memory back from 2013 again. And uh, Drew, back to you. I'll uh, take the camera and we can fly, you can, we can, guide, you can guide me through the PMA. Okay, well, we'll go here through uh, the GA. The GA is what actually attaches the Russian segment to the U.S. Uh, the USOS, the US operating segment. So we're gonna go now transition, we'll go through the PMA and we're gonna pass a bunch of stowage, a bunch of uh, NASA US uh, stowage stowed all 360 degrees around us in, in the PMA. Um, hey, Drew, why, uh, because this is probably easy to get lost, where is the Earth right now? Um, so the Earth right now would be straight through the camera, through your back, all the way down to the, down below you, behind you. So it, it and it actually it it doesn't come easily. You have to think kind of hard about what what, what we're doing, uh, which direction is up. It's very easy to get disoriented, especially I find in the Russian segment because every it's a lot more there are a lot more uh, confined. round confined spaces and a lot less orientation clues uh, uh, than there are in the way that our modules are built. So I'm going to back my way through here into PMA now. I will see stowage. 360 degrees around us. This is where we keep a lot of our, we call them pantries and warehouses. A lot of our common use items like towels and wet wipes and dry wipes and uh, nitrile gloves and things that we use a lot. 
um, are located right in here, so it's easy to get to. Um, when we run out of one thing, we have another backup right nearby. We can take another CTB. This is a, a good place to, to demonstrate something like something common like a hygiene towel. Here's a container full of hygiene towels, and this is where we, we uh, what we use to wash every day. Foil bag that has a towel impregnated with soap already, and we keep that right here so it's in a convenient location. These are all contained in bags called CTBs. Cargo transfer bags. Cargo transfer bags. All right, come on through and now, and this puts us into node one, another one of the old modules, or old original models of the ISS. And now has um, been converted now to where the primary place where we eat this rack right here is the galley. It's one of our favorite racks in the whole ISS. It has our potable water dispenser. Um, and maybe I should just demo fill in a bag real quick. Oh, yeah. So I, our food is uh, stowed here and we have food that we share and there's food we also have our individual containers of food and I just grabbed this one it's tropical punch I uh, would come over here to the water uh, dispenser the potable water dispenser I would dial up oh I need 250 milliliters in this I pretend I, I call this the safety this allows you to dispense it so you don't accidentally dispense it into your face I want ambient water versus hot water and then the bag will fill up then once it's full I'll grab a straw I guess I could have picked less than 250, so it takes so long <laughs> to fill up. But at least now you can drink it, though. Otherwise, it would have been too sweet or too syrupy. Yeah. Uh, and then, now we don't always play with our... Well, we yes, we do. We do. We play a lot. Um, but anyway, that's how we get a drink. Um, uh, we still... let's... Uh... Let's uh, destroy one of the conspiracy theories about our table. Um, one thing that I, that I like to talk about is why do we have a table in space? Well, we still need a surface to work on things, um, but what we use is a system of Velcro, tape, and clips to hold our food in place. So here's a uh, turkey tetrazzini that we had set aside to bring to, uh, to, uh, to Sasha because he really loves turkey tetrazzini. But uh, once we reconstituted and ate this out of the bag, we would you know, maybe put a clip on it and then uh, use, the, use the Velcro here to stick it. Or uh, we have this tape with the sticky side up and it doesn't take much to make something stick to this. And it, and it stays in place and it just gives us a surface to stick things to. I, a couple other things there's a point out here that we can keep food chilled in the in these Merlins that were actually designed for science but uh, they allow us to use them for uh, our food and keep drinks cold and then we have food warmers to put food in and warm it up. Uh, so this kind of food doesn't require reconstitution it's already ready to go they're just like military meals ready to eat MREs and then this is where we would heat it up inside here. This is all new to me when uh, uh, th this galley is pretty new. It didn't come. It, it hasn't been up for many, for uh, very many expeditions. Uh, back in uh, 2013, we didn't have it. We had to use uh, a separate uh, food warmer, which was in uh, in the lab, yeah. together with the water distribution system. Was also was also in the lab. So we didn't have a galley uh, style uh, node. Th this is much nicer, I think. So this um, th an example of food container and. Uh, food stowed in. This is my favorite one. We, we call it Lickies and Chewies, an army term, but it's uh, it's my favorite Bob dessert. It, my favorite Bob is the surf and turf. It's surf and turf that has yeah. all, all the meat and fish. All right. Well, I, why don't I uh, you hand it over to me, and then you can show Cygnus in the airlock. And I'll shoot that. from up here. So we have. Well, Tom, once you mentioned that we have two vehicles uh, right now, and you're going to show Cygnus. Yeah. So, about uh, about a month ago or, or so, we captured Cygnus 12. Um, 
again, for, uh, for those that like history uh, um, details and history and stories, I was the one that captured the first Sinus demo uh, about six years ago, and now we are Sinus 12, so about an average of two Sinus per year. And this one was captured by uh, Jessica, I believe, yep. to get assisted by uh, Christina. And it is unique in its own way because it's the biggest Cygnus uh, to date. Uh, it has uh, uh, four different levels of, uh, of racks with uh, cargo. And we have been working for the past month or so, uh, taking cargo out. Uh, we are almost done with the cargo out and we're starting with the, uh, with the cargo in, which is going to be mostly, it's going to be all trashed uh, when uh, in about uh, uh, 25 days or so we release it. Uh, to burn into the atmosphere. I'm gonna demo how deep it is uh, here and going down into it. So here's the first level. Second level. Third level. And the fourth level is already busy with trash. So I'm gonna stick myself into it to show you just how deep we can go. And I'm currently I hear, I mean the lowest, the lowest part of the space station. This is the closest I can get to Earth from down here. Uh, and um, and and my Soyuz, I guess, is the highest point you can get to on the space station currently. Yeah. So we we were re we before we were in the highest point inside the space station, and this is the lowest point. Um, as you can see. A, a lot of space to, to uh, strap cargo uh, and, and trash. Some of it will be uh, will be in, o over here. And then something very cool about this vehicle, and I think it's really cool. After we close the hatch, we will install a delivery system so that during the descent burn, uh, the signals will release into the uh, into orbit some payloads that will have time to uh, perform some science for uh, paying customers. So just another way to uh, to gain access to space is through this delivery system up here. And now, uh, thank you, I really appreciate Drew, you giving me uh, the voice for uh, the airlock. Th this is one of my favorite places on the space station. Even though right now it doesn't look like much of an airlock because uh, we are in the middle of loading and unloading two vehicles and uh, in about two weeks we will be performing EVAs but, uh, but not before we release uh, to the, the, the one of the cargo vehicles that we will see later. So right now we're using the airlock as a, as a temporary storage location. But when this is not a storage location, this is the temple of extravehicular activities. As you can see to my left and to my right, we have two fully fully installed spacesuits. This is actually Drew's spacesuit for the past four EVAs. This is my spacesuit for the past three EVAs. And uh, uh, in the same configuration that we left them after performing three AMS EVAs, which is a story for a different time. Now behind me, behind me, uh, invisible today, but behind these boxes, there is the actual airlock, the one where that we close and then which will uh, give us access to the vacuum of space. Uh, this is very unique to me and dear to my heart for several reasons. First of all, because again, it's where we do our EVAs, which is uh, very prestigious, very hard, but also incredibly exciting as an activity. Uh, and I hope, I'm sure that Drew, you agree to, uh, uh, to that, especially for us, we were, uh, we did three together as a crew, uh, but also because it's quiet aside it's, uh, it's only used for, uh, for that, so uh, just a very unique, special place. Now, Drew, I'll take the camera and you can lead me through Node 3. And tell me, uh, Node 3 and Cupola, and tell me why it's a special place. All right, well, uh, so now we'll continue from Node 1 into Node 3, where I think we have two exercisers going on right now. Um, Christina and Jessica both exercising. Jessica on A-RED, our resistive exercise device, weight training. And uh, Christina is on a treadmill called T2, and she's actually doing something um, uh, a little bit uh, different, a little more unique. She's doing a backwards walk on the treadmill just to kind of 
as she's just a couple weeks away from returning to Earth. It's uh, I uh, thought to help a little bit with some of your balance muscles when we, as we return, kind of requires a little bit extra coordination. So we'll fly through here. device so it looks like Jessica's just finishing up on uh, here where I'm gonna show you teach you for a second okay. just to give it a look just uh, the fact that it's uh, actually horizontal earth is this way so my crewmate Christina is actually running parallel uh, to, to the ground as opposed to vertical and then, uh, I guess we. This is important too. The, the demonstration uh, of the uh, of the bathroom here, the toilet, the WHC. It's uh, it uses a lot of the same hardware as the ASU, the Russian toilet. It's a it's a Russian design. Um, we have a system that's integrated with it to take urine, collect it, and convert it into drinking water. And so that's an aspect that's unique to ours. But most of the hardware for the actual collecting of the solid and the liquid waste. Is, is Russian and there are components in here that occasionally break. We've had our fair number of uh, repairs on this mission so far and um, those are all behind these panels here and then there's a pretty complicated uh, control panel for what you know at home is just a simple uh, device that you just uh, flush with a single handle. This has a lot of buttons and a lot of instructions in case something goes wrong what to do if you get a red light, the dreaded red light uh, on the panel when you're going to the bathroom. So for uh, urine we have a, a tube that collects it and this takes it through a system that mixes it with some chemicals and then it eventually is processed in the urine processing assembly which is down here underneath us and that gets converted into drinking water. Um, and then for solid waste you can kind of see how this looks a little bit like a toilet. Both, both the hose and the, um, or the solid waste container use suction to make sure that everything goes where it's supposed to but basically solid waste is collected in a bag and then that bag is collected in this container down below here and we change that uh, about every seven or eight days as it fills up and then we discard the can itself in a vehicle like Cygnus um, that will burn up in the atmosphere all right um, we're down here this is a, another uh, thing that makes note three important to us in addition to the toilet and the exercise is the the cupola. You wanna show you wanna show a little bit of A red just to give him an idea of what it's like to exercise on it. I think I will do, we'll shoot that as a as another sole separate thing. Okay. Just keep, it, uh, keep going. Okay, so yeah the, another thing that makes this module special, unique, is uh, the cupola. We're on a night pass right now, so much to show outside. We may have to come back and, and shoot the cupola sure. day, day, day pass. Um, How much time do we have until the next day pass? Until a day pass? Uh, not too long. Maybe Good morning. Or really 15 minutes yeah, I, I or less. Was, Jessica was calling to check in on the status of yeah, uh, there were some open items Sunrise, I had called down earlier when Courtney was on and I was looking for some answers to the North Star America. Trek questions I called down earlier. Um, you, you want, want me to continue, continue in the PMM then? Yeah. Okay, so PMM is uh, I, uh, so for the where we stow a lot of cargo, and, and we'll go, and we also use it we for our, our personal hygiene. So let's fly in here. Uh, we expected them to be, uh, unfortunately they're not, so just the rest of them to talk, it's no constraint on how you do that. Okay, so it's not, so, they don't have to, each individual bracket doesn't need to be wrapped, it's not just, but just like now. Right PMM is fairly full uh, of of all kinds of stowage. We stow all kinds of things in here. One of those things is trash. All these bags back here represent different types of trash. We sort our trash according to whether it's wet, whether it's dry, whether it's hardware related. Um, 
and all those get labeled. So this is a bag of dry trash and those bags get stowed here in the uh, end of PMM and then when it comes time we'll eventually load those in the Cygnus vehicle and all that along with the waste from the waste and hygiene compartment from the toilet will also get loaded into it and that will burn up in the atmosphere. We also use this to, uh, much like the Russians do their personal hygiene, keep a lot of their clothing in uh, modules that have other purposes. This is the same for us. Uh, our gym clothes are stowed in here and we um, dry them out here and we also keep our towels and washcloths in here as well and we do our showering in here and when we do need to shower we would come to this part right here so each of us has a station where our stuff is hanging and we keep things in mesh bags like this uh, and then we pull the curtains down to keep our all the water from our shower from going everywhere and basically we take a sponge bath we took that take that towel that's in uh, impregnated with soap, we add water and then we just wipe down air everywhere and then we hang that to dry and it dries out. And so we use that for two days and then we'll discard the towel. But this is how we get our privacy on all four sides and keep from getting the cargo covered with all of our what, dirty water. Let's fly back to uh, Node 1 and then uh, we'll be going to the lab. Okay. And just to that's correct, uh, we're going to need some uh, words with the ISS program office on that one. So, I suppose we can get So, welcome into the lab. I would say that just like the, uh, the SM and the service module for the Russians is the heart and soul of the Russian segment, I would say that the US lab is the heart and soul of the US segment because it has most of the systems that keep us, us and the station alive. So uh, underneath these racks and uh, on the sides, there are, there's a lot of science going on, but there are some of the main systems that keep the atmosphere clean, that keep the space station pressurized, and the temperature control. It's all in this module. But um, uh, we also have a lot of cameras over here that we use for, uh, for internal uh, photo documentation. Uh, a lot of cameras are obviously in cupola for outside documentation. Uh, uh, and then this is also where we we have a, a two, what looks like two robotic stations. One is the actual robotic station. This is what we use to control the Canadian robotic arm, Canada Arm 2, both doing EVAs and uh, cargo ops. Uh, when, we do, um, yeah. when we do truck and capture, we do it from Cupola. Uh, we didn't show that, to, uh, but that's where an identical station is situated. And on this side, we have a simulator. This is a, uh, what we call the robot station. This is to, these two computers run a simulation of uh, different scenarios where we use the robotic arm. So the controls are identical, the visuals are very similar, just in a smaller scale. Uh, let's continue here. Um, a little bit of a legacy from a different time where we didn't have Node 3 is that over here, uh, in the lab, we have our our uh, our bicycle, which is anything but a bicycle because it only has one. It doesn't have a wheel, and it, it doesn't have a seat, and it doesn't have a, a handle. It's called Civis, which uh, I honestly don't know what it stands for. It's a, it's an acronym for something, but the way we use it is that we rotate it. We lock it in this position, we strap ourselves in with this belt, and then we, we lock uh, our feet on the pedals with uh, just regular biking shoes, and then we have a computerized system that determines a load, and we have different profiles that are individually designed for each of us, because of course uh, we have different capabilities, different needs, so each of us has a different profile loaded, and each of us has different profiles for different time of the uh, uh, of the week, so that we can choose how hard or how easy we want to go, and then we can fold it to get it out of the way. Another unique feature 
uh, underneath this, uh, uh, this panel there is a very high quality window that faces straight down towards the earth and uh, we try to use it as much as we can for uh, uh, earth observation uh, I actually haven't done much, but I know that Drew, Jessica, and Christina really, really love to take pictures from this window. The, the quality of the picture is just it's outstanding. Just Everything else around me here is payloads, which means science, yeah. scientific yeah, labs. Each one of these racks, that's what they're called. Each individual rack is basically a different laboratory. This one is fur for fluid, fluid physics. This one is SIR for combustion. Uh, up here we have uh, an express rack which is basically a uh, modular system where we can, we can install all kinds of different experiments. Uh, this one is for material sciences. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. This one is for material sciences and then more uh, express racks, so more uh, individually tailored uh, experiments. Uh, and then over here, the, the MSG, the, the one of the two uh, main glove box that we have on the space station. Glove box, which means behind behind this panel, there is a there's a, a completely sealed compartment that we can access through gloves in order to isolate the science behind it. Uh, we have another glove box later on. We'll see it in the Japanese module. And then different experiments may have individual glove box contain inside. There is another one in Fur, there is another one in Columbus, and another one in, uh, in, in uh, the Japanese uh, module. So lots of different glove box for science. And then uh, we're gonna swap again and the Jew, why don't you guide us into node 2. Okay. Okay, we're in um, entering node two, so we're getting very close to the most forward part of the space station. Um, the most important thing here is that it has our four crew quarters. There's one overhead, that's where Christina's living right now. Um, one here on the port side, where Luca's living. Down here in the deck, Jessica. And then on the starboard side, there's mine. And we have each of our name tags uh, on our quarters so that uh, we don't forget whose is his. <laughs> So there, yeah, we can go ahead and pan through all of them there. Jessica's uh, name tag is covered by my, my CTB there. Oops. Jessica and uh, mine over here on the side. So basically Drew and I sleep standing up and uh, Christina Sleeps, on the, sleeps on the ceiling. And Jessica probably has the one that would be the most um, uh, classic way of sleeping on the on, on the on the deck if it wasn't that she's actually on the side. So this is a uh, at the same time it's it's our living quarters, our crew quarters where for privacy, but it's also a working place. So working is so we have a workbench here. Um, and it has our tools deployed at all times that we use commonly, markers, eye protection, gloves, scissors, uh, Velcro, pliers, wire cutters, it's all, they're all here and we have a drawer full of tools back in Node 1 if we, that has just about everything you can think of. Now, Luke had mentioned we have two vehicles docked to the ISS right now, so the place is a little bit like, feels like we're just moving in. Uh, so we have stuff stowed everywhere right now. So it's not usually this cluttered, but for the last couple of weeks, this has been the life that we've uh, we've lived here in, in the, the uh, clutter of uh, cargo operations for two simultaneous vehicles, SpaceX and Cygnus. So, so why don't you show me the next uh, the next vehicle that okay. we have here? All right. So Dragon arrived at the beginning of December. 
And uh, this vehicle is unique because we don't send this one home with trash to burn up in the atmosphere. This is the one we use to return science, cargo, hardware back to the ground. This one will recover under parachutes and be and land in the Pacific Ocean and be recovered. So we send things back that we want to keep uh, in here. And so we're in the process of packing it up right now. So I will go ahead and go down into Dragon, which right now has got a lot of, we have a lot of cargo operations involve a lot of foam and a lot of uh, bubble wrap. But I say fly all the way in here past all that and just have a look around the empty cargo compartments as we fill it up here over the next couple of days. A lot of science return. Um, items that need to be kept cold, we uh, pack them in ice and you know they'll be on the gr in the ground and unpacked within a day or so. All right, so we go to, um, make the switch. Oh, and then interestingly here, then these are the two docking ports. They're covered with stowage right now, but the two US crew vehicles, Boeing Starliner and, and uh, SpaceX Dragon will dock to ports that are up front of the space station and then on the Zenith side that's at the top of the, the space station here are these two docking ports and we hope those will be used here in the next couple of months. Uh, let's go into Columbus, I'll take over. Okay. I think Jessica's packing a packing a bag there. She won't mind. I don't mind. You can do this for me. Remember that in the bubble right behind you? Absolutely. Yeah, a demo a demo of uh, Cargo operation. This goes into the bubble bag. This is bubble here. Yep. And this is Columbus. Uh, obviously, the pride and joy of the European Space Agency, this is the, the contribution to the ISIS program by ESA. Um, we have also a lot of cargo here going on, uh, uh, but uh, this, is, this is quite typical uh, uh, right now. Uh, Columbus is a, uh, first and foremost a lab, so uh, the systems are on the, on the deck. Um, uh, they, they, they take over um, uh, four different racks of systems and, and storage, but then on the sides we are on the sides and also on the on the deck uh, we have uh, labs, different kind of labs. So forward is this way, aft is that way, and uh, some some of the thing that makes this uh, module special to me uh, is that this is where we do a lot of the human research. Uh, the two modules at the very back are uh, called HRF module human research facility. So, to me, when I think about uh, Columbus, I will always be th I will always think of doing uh, research that it really interests uh, the, the the human physiology. Uh, another thing that makes it dear to me is that uh, it was built in Italy together with uh, with Note two, Note three, uh, and uh, uh, the cupola. Uh, so uh, obviously a lot of a little bit of Italian pride. Cygnus, the Cygnus uh, structure is also built in Italy. So right now there is a lot of Italy here in the space station. Um, uh, we have uh, some of the some of some of the very advanced uh, facilities that we have here. Uh, right now we have a 3D printer uh, that actually prints in uh, 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 biology tissues uh, right behind this, uh, right behind this. Until a few weeks ago, over here, uh, these are greenhouses where we grew salads. Uh, Drew and Chris, uh, Drew, Jessica and Christina were the main uh, people involved with that project. I was just one of the uh, the tasters, uh, and uh, uh, two different facilities with different lights. This is how we explore in the future what kind of uh, facilities we need to to go be, to go beyond lower orbit and, and explore the the, uh, the planetary system using stuff that we can grow on the space station uh, and then of course uh, like we said a lot of different cargoes uh, uh, because of the cargo ops going on right now uh, drew why don't you show me the japanese module
right. Okay, this is um, JPM or the Japanese Experimental Module, Kibo, and it was uh, built, designed and built uh, by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. And uh, like uh, Luca described, Columbus module, while we're on board, he's the Columbus specialist. He's the one that's primarily doing the European Space Agency work. We both do work over here in uh, the Japanese experimental module. I was trained as a GEM specialist, and so this is the, the module that I'm uh, primarily responsible for since we don't have a Japanese crew member on board. And uh, it's a little bit bigger than Columbus, and it, much like any module, it has both systems racks and it has payloads racks, experiments uh, going on them. One of them that uh, I have just, that flew up, arrived on HTV, is called the Cell Biology Experiment Facility, CBEF, and I just ins uh, installed this, and it's not fully installed yet. But you can see by the number of cables and, and, and boxes uh, on the front of this thing, it's fairly complicated. Um, like good Japanese equipment, it is uh, very well designed, very well built, and um, it's been a lot of fun and challenging to get this installed, and we're looking forward to getting it running here in the coming weeks. But there are a lot of different experiments like this uh, built into the different racks, and when we talk about uh, racks, uh, I think it's probably worth talking about how the, all the modules, if you look outside uh, the space station, the pressurized modules of the ISS are round c cylinders. They look like uh, cans of soda but the, you see the cross-section for us on the inside is actually square, and that's because we have these racks that are installed, and each of these racks are flat in the front and they're rounded to, to match the outer shell of the space station, and it gives us this square uh, shape on the inside. But each of these uh, racks can be taken out and replaced with something else, uh, and so maybe it's a, this, it's a payload uh, rack sometime, but maybe uh, eventually it has to be replaced with a systems rack, or a systems rack needs to be replaced because something has failed and the entire thing needs to be changed out, or we take one out and we turn it into a space that we can use for cargo, because all the other modules that we showed you where there's cargo stowed, uh, we have racks that are exclusively made just for stowing things, like this one here above, and I will look fly, fly and show what, so these are, these are what, uh, what a, a neat neatly stowed rack looks like. Uh, this is not uh, overfilled by our definition of the, of the word, um, but even the Japanese experimental module is not uh, immune to being stowed, uh, stow, stowage on the deck here. We have a lot here from the vehicles that have arrived, so normally this would be wide open ideally, uh, but we do have a lot of stowage here on the deck of uh, the Japanese experimental module. Uh, the, maybe worth showing also uh, a Melfi, uh, which is a freezer that they can that uh, s samples science samples can be frozen to all different temperatures. Um, I don't know what it, what's the, some of the, the lowest temperatures in Melfi that you've seen. Maybe minus ninety five. Or is that polar? I always, the, the different freezers have different uh, capabilities, and, and this Melfi freezer uh, has four compartments in them, and we're frequently taking samples in and put uh, put samples in, taking samples out. We also do a lot of our public affairs events here because it is one of the more uh, special clean uh, modules, and it happens to be also at the you know at this uh, as a nice backdrop here. Uh, for us to do public affairs events, and it doesn't, it's not in the way, whereas if we do them in the lab, it's right in the middle of, of everything. Um, there's a robotic workstation in here for the robotic arm that's on the outside of the gym. And then behind me is another uh, piece of equipment that Luke and I uh, are trained on and, and to use frequently. It's a small airlock for putting payloads in and out, not for putting astronauts in and out, just payloads. And there's a slide table inside that slides in and we mount uh, maybe a satellite deployer or a small um, experiment that needs to go outside. It goes in, they depressurize the airlock, the, arm, the small robotic arm on the other side grabs onto it and then installs it on a platform that's called the Jeff that's just on the outside of the, uh, of the gym. And it has an optic. An attic, yes. Yeah, so the, the attic 
uh, JLP that the. Uh, Go ahead and fly up and show. Uh, okay. All right. Yep. Let's. I'll follow you. So this is JLP, uh, which is another stowage module here in. Uh, attached to the gym, and it is filled with stowage, uh, more a little more neatly than PMM, but um, nevertheless, it's it still looks like it's uh, it can look like a mess, but it is actually very well organized, and and you can find things by location codes. Everything has a uh, everything has a place, and it has a nomenclature, and we think of things in terms of. Uh, of how they uh, fit into the ISS coordinates, so starboard, port, aft, and forward. And it's actually very easy to get confused on which direction that is, so they're written right on the different bulkheads so that you know which direction, which, which, uh, which wall, for lack of a better term, you need to go to. All right, so Luca, this is what I was thinking then, but uh, we we also need to go shoot uh, the cupola again. But let's do this. Let's do. Uh, I will. I'll hold, and we'll do a fly through uh, where you're out ahead, just flying through all the way back to the Russian segment, and then we'll reverse it, and then we'll do a fly through back this direction uh, where you're holding it. Okay. So let's let's go up here. And we do it uh, with me facing the camera, or with or yeah, you fa is facing the camera as much going as going well, like a, like a B roll. Uh, okay. if, you, if you, yeah, whichever you can, you okay. can move around. Okay. okay. So, and you, you can. It's not a, not a tour per se. Just a, yeah, just, just a fly, a B just roll, fly by. B, B roll, but you can say things as we, as we go. Ready? Let's go. All right. All right. Let's fly out of JLP. I'll say where we are as we go. Um, and through the gym. Do some flips if you're feeling good. <laughs> there you go, that's good. to uh, Columbus. you to respond to some one of your colleagues, Bill Cassidy, Republican Senator from Louisiana, sort of implied our, when I said a piece of the
Today we go to uh, Kupla. Yep. We're going to talk Kupla to do for me. We'll fly through again. Do you want to talk about the cupola? So cupola uh, is obviously one of the places that astronauts love for many different reasons. Uh, but I suppose that the main reason why we like it so much is because it gives us a 360 degree view through the seven windows of our planet Earth. Uh, if you ever heard of the overview effect, this is where we get it. We understand how fragile Earth is because we get to see about 6,000 kilometers of it in one in one one shot, and we we have a very clear view of how thin the atmosphere is, how fragile our planet is, and sometimes we sometimes we think that the most fragile thing on Earth is probably us. We are the most fragile and the most dangerous thing at the same time, and this view is just so unique and such an incredible humbling place to see it. It makes you feel really small and really part of something big at the same time. Now operationally we actually do use it. Right here we have a, a robotic workstation that uh, lets us control the robotic arm which is right there right now and through that robotic arm we um, capture and birth um, several cargo vehicles that come to the space station to uh, refurbish our uh, all our needs food water uh, different kind of gases experiments and uh, all sorts of cargo and as you can see signals here too. yep and as you can see the earth is just an incredible incredible view and no matter how many times you come in here no matter how many times you look outside the view is never the same it always it's always different the light might be different the time of the year might be different the clouds are always different and with a little bit of luck we will be different too So, in order to prevent um, too many too many uh, meteorite strikes, um, we try to keep it open during the during the day so that we have a good uh, so that we have a view of the Earth and that we can enjoy the sight. But when nobody is going to be watching it, we we like to close uh, the windows. And so we have a manual, very simple manual system that works perfectly well. And uh, these are this is how we close the window. This is the main window, window number seven, and then on the sides we have a similar system to close the shutters and uh, prevent micrometeorite strikes from damaging our windows. Okay. And then if you would open window seven again. And then let's get a view now with both of us in this camera with the view of this on looking out. Yep. Both of us on this side. Absolutely. Right? So thank you for joining us on this 2020 tour of the International Space Station, the 20th year of the ISS's continuous human presence on board the ISS. It's been our pleasure to show you around our home. Uh, constantly a, a work in progress, constantly a work of art, a work of science. I hope you enjoyed the tour as much as we did. Uh, it was really our pleasure to be your guide tours. I'm European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano. And I'm NASA astronaut Andrew Morgan.